Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. The Census Bureau has released its annual data on U.S. migration patterns, and the journal has an editorial on this today called The Blue State Exodus Continues. And Kim, let me go right back to you with this. What do you think that we have learned from this latest batch of data about which states Americans are leaving and which states they're moving to? Yeah, it's totally fascinating. U.S. population grew by about 1.2 million between July 2021 and July 2022. But foreign immigration was about a million of that total. And even though we had all of these people pouring into the country, certain states still managed to lose population because of people who were exiting them for sunnier and happier and lower tax climbs. So California was at the top of the list. It lost the most residents to other states, 343,000. But behind it was New York, and then number three was Illinois. And then among some of the other states that were population losers, meaning they had a net exit, were New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Oregon, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Louisiana. And what we found is that most of them ended up going to places that have lower taxes, better housing, higher standards of living, less crime, better schools. Top of the list was Florida, who got the most newcomers, 318,000. Behind it was Texas, but then North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and Arizona. Also, funny little note, West Virginia actually had more people move to it than leave it for the first time in a decade. I thought that was a, an interesting little side note. One phrase of the editorial really stuck out at me, though, is that Texas and Florida are 15 percent of the U.S. population and accounted for 70 percent of population growth in the past year. Manet, I think that is an astounding figure. And some of that probably has to do with warm weather. There's been a migration towards the Sun Belt for years and years now. That is not a new phenomenon. But the balance of that, 15% of the U.S., but 70% of the population growth, I mean, it certainly seems as though people in high-tax states where there is public disorder, uh, they're looking at these two red states as sort of the promised land. Absolutely. And first, I wanted to start off by addressing the warm weather point. That's something that a lot of defenders of blue states will often point out when they say oh, people aren't going to states with low cost of living. They're just trying to find somewhere where it's not going to be extremely cold in the winter. But as Kim mentioned, California was the biggest loser, and it certainly has among the finest weather you can find anywhere in the country. And so I think that that should be a counterpoint against the idea that people are merely seeking somewhere warm and comfortable. But to your broader point, I do think that Texas and Florida really have succeeded in making themselves an ideal escape from someone who's trying to get a away from a high cost of living and find just a place where it's kind of easier to find a high quality of life. They have big cities in them, so it's not the same as going to one of the heartland states or somewhere where it's going to be difficult to find a job or difficult to find a suburb that seems like it has lots of amenities. There's been a massive job growth in places like Dallas and Austin and also in Miami in Florida, and so people are very attracted to that. But at the same time, that low cost of living is a huge savior, especially during this period where we're experiencing massive inflation. So I do think that people have seen how much they're paying for not a much better standard of living in some of these northeastern states and in California, and they have the opportunity to really, really slice their cost of living by quite a lot while also increasing their quality of life in places like Texas and Florida. And so I expect that trend to continue for years. A couple of thoughts I have on this data too. I went back and looked at the results from last year, and it looks like it's down a little bit. So if you look at the data from the editorial we ran last year, it says that about 152,000 people in Illinois left for other states. This year, it's 142,000. California, it was 429,000. This year, it's 343. And New York, last year, it was 406,000. And this year, it's 299. And so maybe this is my first brush hypothesis is this is a little bit of rerouting 
after COVID. There were a couple of years where people's jobs were had gone remote. They weren't seeing friends. They weren't seeing family anyway. And so people felt less tied down than they did. And maybe this is the beginning of the reversal of that. The other is just if you look at the trends in these population flows, you have to think about what the next redistricting, what the next congressional reapportionment will look like or could look like after the 2020 census. And there's an interesting tweet thread here from a analyst with the Brennan Center, a left of center group that does a lot of work in voting. And the tweet says, if the population trends of the past two years remain constant for the rest of the decade, here's what reapportionment in 2030 after the 2030 census would look like. Florida would get three new congressional seats Texas would get four, Utah, Tennessee, North Carolina, Idaho, Georgia would all get one. The losers, California would lose five seats, Illinois would lose two, New York three, Minnesota one, Pennsylvania one, Rhode Island one. And Kim, I mean, that is a remarkable result because if you think about how that would change a House election or even a presidential election, because remember, these are the numbers that also flow into how many electors each state gets in the electoral college, it's a swing of, you know, maybe 10 or 15. And that could be really important. And granted, there's a lot of caveats there. We don't know if those population trends will continue. But there were blue states that lost House seats after the 2020 census. And it seems on current trends that we should expect just even more of the same in the next decade. Yeah, we also don't know if those states will remain solidly Republican either, right? A couple of those that you listed on there, one obviously being Georgia has become a little bit more of a purple state in recent years. North Carolina is considered a bit of a swing state, but it could be a profound shift. It could be a rewriting of the electoral map at least for the next decade. You know, we've long looked at this map and you see these pictures where they do the blue and the red. And, you know, you look at the coast and it's this sea of blue and and the middle and the south, it's all red. But what that map misses is how many people are living in those areas. And that's what matters in presidential elections and in these House elections, that if more and more in the population is moving to states that allow them to live more freely, then the map very much shifts on current trends trends to Republicans. And just one point, too, I'd make as well, Kyle, on your point about how this compared to last year. I'm not sure that we will see a reversal of this. And here's why, because I think COVID was very, very bad for blue states and in ways that go way beyond public health, because what it did is for the first time, it allowed all of those people who are out there, and we all know one who hated living in some of these cities, hated the taxes they had to pay, hated everything about it, but were only doing it because that's where their job was. And suddenly with COVID, remote work became a whole new aspect of the American lifestyle and work process. And I think a lot of people, especially a newer generation of workers, are now going to take that on board. And they're going to be a lot more free in their decisions about where they move and a lot less willing to necessarily just stick around in a city that they don't like where the politicians are piling on the burdens when they could quite easily easily go and get a job somewhere else, especially as more and more businesses are moving to these states as well, too, getting out of some of these high tax areas. So there's going to be more and more employment opportunities. Thank you, Kim and Manet. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button, and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch. (laughs) 